My wife has graciously agreed to do this with me. She was hesitant, I'll admit. She was like, I don't know if I want to come up there and field all these questions, but um, I'm going to ask Michelle if she'd come up. Would you give her a hand? She's, she's been awesome to help me with this. Yeah, I prayed for a catastrophic illness or to break my leg, but obviously God didn't want me to do that, so yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm here. I didn't yeah. break my leg, so I'm good. Yeah. So I appreciate her doing this. And if those of you who don't know her, this is Michelle. And um, she, we have been married for 23 years. And uh, God has been very gracious to us, given us four kids. And, um, and so she's, she's got a ton of wisdom. Um, she counsels with ladies um, a lot and, um, and just has great wisdom to, uh, to, to impart, I think, for, for all of us. And so we just want to take your questions. And we're going to do these live. You, you, you send them in. And, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there, okay? Um, and so we'll try to get as many as we can and be as succinct as we can, and yet try to, try to uh, do this completely. So let's go with the first one, guys. And um, uh, what is our responsibility to make ourselves attractive to our spouse? That's a, that's a really good question. Because, you know, last week, if you weren't here, what I talked about was um, you know, that, that our standard of beauty, and this is especially true for guys, and because I, I don't think women have the same hang-ups as guys, but our standard of beauty is our wives, okay? So, you know, my standard of beauty is not that winged creature on, you know, <laughs> Victoria's Secret magazines. It's Michelle. And, and so I want to look at her, and that's where I find beauty. But, you know, so I've told you, if your wife is... is uh, 20, you love 20-year-olds, right? And if she's got long black hair, you love long black hair. If she suddenly shaves it off and turns it red, you love it. You're like, I love short-headed red, you know, red-headed women. You know, that's, that's your standard of beauty woman. now. Woman, yeah, woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Told you, great wisdom, great wisdom. So, so uh, okay, so on the one hand, you could hear that and you could go, okay, I can do whatever I want with myself and he has to love me. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to talk or to think like that. Um, one of the things I'll tell you that I appreciate about Michelle is, you know what, both of us, we've gotten older um, and, and, you know, we don't look like we did when we were 22, of course. Um, you know, I'm a lot more hairy than I was back then, you know. I know that's a horrible mental image for most of you, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just true. You, you just, you get older and there's just like, ah, this is, you know, terrible. And that's why I'm doing like insanity right now. Not so, you know, I'm just like, this is, and it's crazy by the way. Any, anyways, all that to say, all that to say, I think it would be a mistake for you to take the, and, and make the conclusion that you can do whatever you want and let yourself go. Um, and I'll let Michelle speak to this because one of the things I love about her is that, is that Michelle has strived our entire life to, to try and be attractive. I mean, and, and has done a wonderful job, by the way. I mean, I think she's beautiful. And, and she, you know, she's not one of these girls where I come home and, you know, she stays at home and she works like crazy out of the home. But I can't think on, I think maybe on, uh, on one hand, I could count the number of times I came home and she's still in her pajamas. You know, one of those things where she's wearing the moo-moo. And... <laughs> Wow, babe, the curlers look awesome. You know, it's not that at all. She's really always gets up, always gets ready, and that sort of thing. But, baby, why don't you talk to, talk to the ladies, because maybe this is... But, you know, I, this does apply to guys. I mean, guys, the beer belly and all that is just not cool. And, you know, just sort of letting yourself go and she'll love me. I think it's a mistake for everybody. And, and maybe she's not as sensitive to it. But I think you... I think it's a good question, actually, to ask one another. And to not, not like, hey, do you think I'm ugly? But, but like, what can I do to be more attractive to you? Because I think that's a real blessing. That's showing the other person you love them. And, and I want to be as attractive as I can to you. So why don't you talk about that? Okay. Well, there's several things I, that pop into my head. I think for women in particular, you know, we struggle with our physical identity a lot. I mean, I know I have, especially, I mean, all, probably in my whole life. I mean, you know, if we're all honest as women, we do struggle with our physical beauty because, you know, we look in the mirror and let's face it, we're not usually happy with some part of our body, face, legs, whatever. I could just make a long list for myself. But... 
I think first and foremost, we have to work as a woman on our identity being in the Lord and being grateful and content with the body that he's given us, okay? So that's step number one. And that may take a lifetime. I mean, I, like I said, I still struggle with that. I mean, it's one of those things that's on my prayer list on a regular basis to be content with the body that I have. And especially as I've gotten older, you know, my contentment level wanes a little bit more because I, I, I you know, look again, look in the mirror and don't see exactly what I look like at 23 and want to recapture that. But we have to learn to be content as God wants us to uh, with our with our bodies. I think another thing, though, that goes along with that is um, is doing the best that we can to keep our bodies as fit as we can. Part of that is just being a good steward to what the Lord's given us. Mm-hmm. You know, take the husband out of the equation. You know, we have to, we've been given this body. Bodies are important to the Lord or else he would have made us all just float around, I guess, in a spirit form. So we need, we have have a commitment to take care of our bodies as best as we can. I mean, I like sugar like probably most of you do, so I enjoy a cupcake uh, every so often, but I'm doing the best that I can to be as fit as I can. Mm -hmm. You know, that can actually be a really neat component of a married relationship where, you know, Chris and I have tried for uh, the last few years in particular, really our whole married life, to try to find things that we can do together to build our relationship and build our friendship. And, you know, you've got kids, whatever, it's hard to find that. But then over this last summer, um, um, you know, we both decided to start this crazy, this insanity thing, which is just about killed us both. But hey, you know, that's another story. So, but we decided to work on it together. Now, have we had the perfect results we wanted? I didn't lose like 20 pounds, but we, we're doing something together. We're keeping each other accountable in many ways, which I think is, is a really good thing. And, you know, as a husband, I would say, keep that in the back of your mind that your wife struggles with her identity physically probably um i mean i'm i'm you know maybe some of you are really excited about the about the way you look which is great if you are but i know most women do um because of just what's projected out there on the billboards that we see because the airbrush photos that we look at when we go through the grocery line or again reminiscing about what we used to look like in our 20s or or whatever but as a husband you can really help your wife as you are making that standard of beauty her and not those images Images that you see, um, you know, people that you see, because we we women see plenty of other women that we would like to look like them. Um, so I think that that's a, you know, that's on both sides. You can do that, but we need to make that commitment um, on both sides to to help each other. I think. Good. Yeah, that's great. All right, next question. Uh, I've been divorced for several years, but my ex-spouse and I are trying to reunite. Can this work? Yes, absolutely. Now let me just say something. Uh, th- I say yes, and I'm assuming if you are legally divorced, um, the only time I would counsel you not to get remarried is if you're, one of you are not Christian. Because that's very clear in the Bible, that we're not supposed to marry a non-Christian. And so what you need to pray for uh, before you reunite and not reunite until that other person becomes a Christian. But assuming this is true, that both are saying, hey, we've come to Christ, we love Jesus, uh, we, we want to get back together, then absolutely it can work. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be things you have to work through and, and maybe old ruts that you'd fall back into. You probably want to get some good counseling. Um, and if you need recommendations for that, I've got people that we work with that, that we you know, want, want to put you through. And, and, and you know, even going to our premarital counseling, we, we do it once a year um, where you know, the goal of our premarital counseling is to divorce you before you get married. And so um, you know, getting you to ask a ton of questions of one another and make sure this is the right person that God has for you. So, yeah, it can work. I think by the, the, the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the gospel at work in your marriage, absolutely, I believe this can, this can work. In fact, I've seen it happen uh, several times where couples that used to be married got divorced, got remarried, and, uh, and the Lord just did a wonderful work there. So uh, I would encourage you, if you are both Christians, uh, to pursue that. I think that's a great thing, and, and, um, and I applaud you for, for even thinking like that. So, okay, well, uh, next one. How many times should you forgive your spouse? A problem with alcohol, pornography, anger. Uh, yeah, you, you, you want, want me to do the start this one? Okay, all right. Because um, she's the one that has to do all the forgiveness in our relationship. Uh, I, I don't have an alcohol problem or porn problem. Um, anger, probably another issue. But, um, well, okay, let, let, let's. <laughs> I just said maybe, not really. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
it, alcohol and pornography are, are big deals. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not under, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay anger because anger can be at such a level that it's abusive and it, it comes out in violence and that's, that's never acceptable. If you're, if you're, spouse, your husband is being violent against you, like, like you're having, you think that God wants you to endure beatings, that's wrong. You get out. Uh, if you tell us, we will, we will report it to the police. And I don't tell you that to threaten you. I tell you that you should. And, and that's not something that you endure. But if we're talking about sort of low-level anger and outbursts and that kind of thing, um, I think that's a different issue. But when we're talking about alcohol, let's say it's alcoholism and how that robs people of their identity and, and, and takes a daddy away from his family and, and maybe causes some of the anger and abuse. Those are, those are bigger issues. Um, those can lead, quite frankly, to I think one of the exceptions in Scripture where the Bible gives, uh, Paul gives an exception for sexual immorality and abandonment. And I think it's possible to abandon your spouse and still live in the same house and still be married. And so I think you have to be very careful. And, and alcohol, again, can rise to a level that this isn't just a disagreement about I don't drink, he does. This is, I'm assuming, alcoholism. And that can rise to a level where, where abandonment occurs. And it's so unrepentant and, and you know, repetitive in the home. And it's causing such damage that, uh, that I think you know, forgiveness, it's not that you, listen, you should forgive them completely, totally, always, all your life. There's never a point when Jesus is going to say to you, you it, 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 he's gone too far. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to forgive him anymore. There's a difference between forgiving and then what you do with that. Okay, Jesus wants us to walk in forgiveness, right? To, to love each other, forgive one another and all that. And, and, and you, you harboring bitterness and hatred toward this spouse of yours as it builds up over the years isn't killing anybody but yourself, right? So, so the forgiveness issue, you know, you should forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. Should you stay with them? And, and would these be grounds for divorce? Possibly. Pornography can rise to a level um, where, you know, he keeps going back. And listen, the Bible is very clear. Somebody who is involved in sexual morality, unrepentantly, so repetitively, I mean, just kind of continuously, Jesus says very clearly, won't inherit the kingdom of God. That's Jesus talking. Okay, so, so, so this is a serious matter, and, and, and you know, hopefully it'll splash a little bit of cold water in your face to realize you're, you're, you're facing something far worse than divorce or not having a happy marriage. You're facing an eternity without, without God, without Christ. Um, and, and, and obviously that's, that's a place we don't want to go. So, so I, I think that um, forgiving whether you stay married or this has risen to such a level that it results in divorce. I'm not counseling you to get divorced, by the way. Unless there's abuse in your home, you need to get out of that. But, but this rises to such a level. I think, you, you know, even if you divorce, you've got to come to a place where you say, I can still forgive. Why? Because Christ forgave me. There is no sin that will ever be committed against you. I don't care how heinous you think it is. There will be no sin that is greater than the mountain of sin that Christ had to forgive you and the death that he died to do that for you. And that's what fuels our ability to forgive other people. You want to add to that at all? No, I think that, I mean, I think that okay. gets good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, all right, next one. Uh, I believe sex to be bountiful and abundant in my marriage. My wife wants it to be rationed. <laughs> Where do we meet? <laughs> okay, you want to do that yeah, one? Sure, yeah, sure, I'll go do ahead. that one. Why not? I, I think that I like that idea of the rationed. It's like you're on you know, like a lifeboat or something. You're going to just dole it out as we need to. And you know what? That's a common problem, isn't it? Let's just be honest, okay? That usually the husband is like, you know, all steam ahead. And the wife's like, I'm tired. I've got the kids. I need, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be with you. But I just, you know, I want it to be more rationed out, as the, as the question said. Um, so I think where you start with that one is, that's, a, you know, where we meet is you meet in talking about what does it mean to have bountiful and abundant sex and what does it mean when the wife says, I want it to be rationed. Um, you know, those can both mean a lot of different things uh, as far as days and times and all that stuff. So the first thing you need to do is sit down and communicate, not while you're having sex though, I just might add, or when you're in a really bad 
bad mood or angry about what your definition of bountiful, abundant, and ration should mean. And then once you come together an agreement on that, um, then you can go forward and, and uh, you know, make the proper decisions about that part of your life. I mean, I do believe that sex should be abundant and bountiful in marriage, but it has to be something that each couple decides together what that looks like. Um, but by no means should uh, a wife deprive her husband. Um, you know, that is one of the gifts and blessings in marriage. Like Chris talked about a couple weeks ago, I did not see that as a gift when we were first married. I really didn't see it as gross either, but I didn't see it as a gift. Um, you know, like I do now. And I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about, you know, being married for longer periods of time is that you begin to see things in a different light, which is, was really terrific. Um, but come together and agree. I mean, we talked about this before, literally make a calendar. I mean, you calendar everything else in your life, right? So why not put that on the calendar? There's, it doesn't ruin spontaneity. And I, and I think I'm, some of the people that have been married for a while that are a little older can really appreciate, you know, if you don't put it on the calendar, there's a good likelihood it's not going to uh, it's not going to be a regular part of your life um you've got a lot of responsibilities and ladies i know you're tired i mean i've got four kids they run me ragged i feel like i'm giving 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 all day long and sometimes we come to the end of the day and i'm like i've got to give more to my husband sometimes i don't have it in myself, by myself, but through the grace of God, I can have that. And my prayer for 23 years has been, you know, sometimes uh, sex can be a duty and sometimes it can be a delight. And so my prayer my whole life has been, God, make it more of a delight all the time because I benefit from it just as much as my husband. And not only that, but my family benefits from it and because we're in harmony together. So talk about it and, uh, and get that on the calendar, just like everything else. My kids last night were like, where is that calendar? Because they don't think we want to see it. We said, it's right, right here. here. You will not find that in my house. <laughs> like, ah! maybe, they, maybe we should put the calendar out, then they leave us alone. So. Uh, Do not knock on that door. So. Uh, all right, next question. How do you fully forgive your spouse after an affair? And how do I deal with thoughts and memories of the affair. Well, uh, probably fully, uh, probably means you're thinking maybe that, that there's gotta be forgetfulness almost, like, yeah, I'm just like it never happened. I don't think that's full forgiveness. I don't think certainly on a human plane that's full forgiveness. You know, the Bible talks about God being able, he, he takes our sins, he casts them into the sea, never to remember them again. Only God can do that. You, you and I can't, um, but, by the grace of God, there can be something that I guess we on a human plane would talk about as full forgiveness. And, and, that we, and, and that's going to take time, okay? We're not God, and we can't just say, you know, I forgive and I'll never remember again. I think it's a daily. Here's what I would counsel you to do. When you feel those thoughts of, you know, these memories, the, the, the feelings of anger that come up, which are bound to come up, by the way. Um, what you have to do is, is stop yourself and, and be very, very careful not to rehearse your anger. Okay, and you, you, you do this, right? I mean, I do this. You, you think about that conversation you would have had. You know, or that conversation you're going to have and, and you want to get back at somebody and you've got it all rehearsed out in your mind. You, all you're doing is fueling your anger and unforgiveness and all that stuff. You've got to stop yourself and you've got to say very quickly, you know, to yourself, stop, okay, and God help me. And remember and let your mind go from there to Christ's forgiveness of you. I honestly believe this is the only way people can be healed and know real forgiveness. If, if their unforgiveness, if you become fixated on what your husband or your wife did, okay, you, you'll, you, this forgiveness is going to be very elusive to you. If you focus rather on what Christ has done for you, the gospel, then suddenly it becomes something like, okay, Jesus, you, I mean, all the sins that I've committed against you and continue to com commit against you. You know, the things I should do and I don't do, the things that I, I, I'm not supposed to do and I do. I mean, all these things, and I am, I am riddled with sin, and yet you, you forgive me. 
And so God, help me to be able to extend that kind of forgiveness. I honestly think that's the only way you're ever going to get to a place where you say, I can, I can grant to you forgiveness full and free. Um, will you always remember? Yeah, but I think, it will, I think it will become less and less and less as you grow back together. Now listen. If you're on the other side of this and you hear me talking to your spouse right now and saying, oh, they're supposed to fully forgive you, don't you dare go home and say, hey, you heard what Pastor Chris said. Come on, what's your problem? No, work with them. Mm-hmm. Understand where they are. I mean, I mean understand that you've, you've you know, if this, is a, if this is a sexual affair, even mentally or whatever, that, that is a blow to the marriage that, that possibly could be a biblical warrant for you even being divorced. So, so rather than, than saying, hey, you know, I asked you for forgiveness and it's been six months, we should be done with this, okay? Again, both of you need to be going back and saying, understanding what your sin has done. And the, and the, and the offender needs to understand how, how horribly they have wounded this marriage and working to reconcile that and praying to God to help that to happen and understanding that your first sin isn't against her, I'm assuming that, let's assume this is a man that committed the affair. The first sin isn't against her. The, the first sin is against God. This is David, right? David and Bathsheba. He says to God, against you and you only have I sinned, right? So, so, so he looks and says, my first sin is against God and God, and, and that will keep you humble. And that'll keep you from feeling like you better hurry up and forgive me. And on the other side, she's looking in and saying, you know what, I need to... I, I need to work and, and, and try to be gracious even when I don't feel like it and, and try to forgive when that's difficult for me and constantly running back to the gospel. Um, I, I just, I don't see any other way uh, around this and, and understand that, that that's what probably full forgiveness is gonna look like in your marriage, okay? Okay. All right, next one. Can someone rape their spouse? Yes. And, and I, when you say can, does that happen in marriage? It happens, is that legitimate absolutely not okay there there is <laughs> there is no warrant for that and and unfortunately this happens this is this happens more and more commonly where it is a it's a violence it's a dominance of one partner over another um, it's a it's a you know an over demanding forceful thing that is never. God meant, meant sex to bring oneness. He meant it to bring protection. I mean, think of that. This is supposed to be this very protective environment where you're coming together and saying, I love you and, and I'm giving myself to you. I'm not, rape is I am taking everything that I can get from you. And that is, that is a sin under heaven. And if that's happening in your marriage, it must stop. And if this is going on and there needs to be counseling or something, go get counseling. But listen, if this is something where it's that, there's that kind of abuse happening, get out. Get out. This is, this is violence. Okay? Now, 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 please understand when I just say rape, this isn't a woman going or whatever man that, saying, well, I'd rather not, but okay, I'll give in. Okay, now, now, now I'm talking about a man who's saying, you'll give in whether you like it or not. We're going to do this, and I'm going to take from you, and whatever. That, that's, that's rape, and, and absolutely, and it's a crime. <laughs> it's a crime, and it's a sin, and, uh, and that must not uh, be happening within your home. Do you want to add to that at all? No, I think that's okay. that good. Okay. Who should handle the finances? Don't you do it? <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, that is a great question because that is one of those things that does come up and can cause problems. I mean, you could fill in the blank with a lot of things. Who should handle, you know, washing the dishes, all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of, this would be kind of like an overall view of all of those kind of questions. Um, first of all, I think that um, the husband is responsible for making sure that things get done in the home. And by that, I mean, you know, they're going to be held responsible by the Lord to make sure that their home runs well. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have to do all the things in the home to make it run well. They're the overseer, right? Just like um, Adam oversaw the garden. Um, that is the job. 
job of our husband. If you guys remember, you know, when God came back and said, you know, uh, uh, when he was, you know, talking to them about and confronting them on their sin of Eve eating the fruit, he did not, he cursed, you know, she had a, a some, a, well, it's not a curse, curse right? Yeah, yeah. curse yeah. bear. But he went to the man. He said, hey, why weren't you taking care of your wife, protecting her and leading this situation? You're just standing there like an idiot and she's eating the fruit. Why didn't you just smack it out of her hand or something, right? So the husband is responsible for what goes on in the home and how it runs. And what we're, our jobs as wives is to help them with that task, okay? So how that boils down in your family is something that, again, needs to be discussed, not when you're mad about your checkbook bouncing or, or you're ticked off because, you know, you've been washing the dishes and doing all things by yourself. It happens when you sit down together and decide who is best equipped for the different things to run in the home. And, I mean, that is made a little bit tougher these days because so many women are working outside the home. So I think that has to be taken in consideration. If you have decided that your family is going to be a two-income family, whether you've decided that or it's been kind of foisted upon you because of the economy, which I totally understand, then there have to be some concessions made, I think, with all of those things. You know, a woman is very strong and can multitask, but cannot manage all the household duties and working outside the home if that, as a husband, you've asked her to do that as well. Um, you know, she can't do that. She needs your help to do that. Um, I would say I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but I think it's kind of important to get covered all. If you as the husband have put that burden on your wife to work outside the home, then maybe you need to reconsider what you're doing. If you have not been willing to take on more responsibility to provide for your home and you're asking your wife to do a lot more than, than maybe she's capable of doing because she's working full time, trying to take care of you and have sex with you and also um, take care of your family. It's not a weapon, but you know, she's, you're wanting her, all these things from her, you've got to maybe reconsider. What else are you asking her to do that's beyond what she's able to do? Um, and so, down to the finances in particular, who's better at that? Yeah. You know, Chris and I have switched that back and forth over the years. I'm probably more of a detail person, but I'm not the most organized person in the world, and so I probably would lose all of the papers if I'm not careful. Um, but so what he does, what we do in our home, is he manages the money from the top down, and he puts it where it needs to go, makes sure our, our retirement's going. I probably would spend it all otherwise because I just love to spend. But um, he, you know, puts 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 things away. He manages the accounts. And then what he does is we're big Dave Ramsey fans. So if you haven't done financial peace, get ready for the one in the fall and, and do that, please. It will help you so much. He'll give me the cash that we live on in our home for the the up upcoming couple of weeks till we get paid again. And so it's my responsibility to manage the household cash funds. So if he need, if you ever want to get money from Chris, don't go to him, come to me because I have all the cash. Um, but you know, I'll give him like 10 bucks a week to get a Starbucks card <laughs> or something. So I dole out the money to him. Um, and then if we go out to eat, you know, he'll ask me, do we have the money to go out to eat? And I'll either, you know, see we have money in there or I'll like, you know, take it out of groceries or something <laughs> if I really want to go out to eat instead of making something at home. So we kind of do you know we both take yeah. care of the finances in that yeah. way yeah. so I think that's you know no, I, I think there's some ladies that are geniuses at finances and you ought to handle the finances and I think there's other there's men who are and so I don't think that's a I think it's a gender thing I think it's a it's who who's probably most qualified to, to do it within your marriage and you guys should discuss that yeah next question how do you define purity in a dating relationship does it change once you're engaged that's great that's a great question uh, well, you know, there's this whole, right, there's the age-old question of um, at every teen seminar of how far is too far, right? I mean, at when do I know if I've gone over the edge? Um, and I, and I, I honestly think that's the wrong uh, question to ask. I, I, think, I think it's we don't want to see how close we can dance to the edge. We want to see how close we can stay to Jesus. Um, and Jesus, listen, I think until you're married that the man or woman that you're with, you should view them more in terms of kinship, and by that I mean brother, sister, spiritually. I know that sounds creepy, but that's biblical. <laughs> I'm supposed to view every other woman in this place as a sister. Now, that puts a lot of limits, Right? <laughs> If I really, really, if people, if guys would genuinely treat women like this, you would never sleep with your sister. 
You would never do things, with, you'd be like, that's gross, that's, that's incestuous, right? That's wrong. And I think that's, what, that's why the Bible puts that. You treat younger women, you treat them like sisters, not like potential, you know, this could really turn into something, okay? That'll completely restructure your relationship. That'll completely restructure how you view what purity is. <laughs> so you ask yourself the question, does purity, would, 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 would I make out with my sister? I hope not. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, would we be steaming up the back of the car? No. Okay, so, so now, I, I'm not saying you can never kiss this girl who's your, who you're engaged to or you're dating or whatever, but I will say this. Uh, somebody has said that, that physical, your, and you've heard me maybe talk about this before, your physical relationship is, is like an on-ramp, and we talk to our kids like this. It's like an on-ramp, and you only get on an on-ramp for one reason, and that's to speed up and go fast, right, and get onto the highway. You don't get onto an on-ramp and go, ah, I'm gonna, I got to turn back around and sort of back my way out of it, okay? Your physical relationship is an on-ramp. And I've told my kids, I'm not telling you you can't kiss your boyfriend and girlfriend, but I'm telling you, you'll never go backwards, ever. You'll only, that, that car basically doesn't have a reverse. So if you go from holding hands, remember the first time you held hands with, with a guy, a girl? I mean, you, 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 I'm assuming, you know, like, so for the first time I held, I remember the first time I held Michelle's hand. And you're like, oh, this is awesome, right? I love this. <laughs> and then we kiss, and suddenly hand holding wasn't as powerful, right? Okay? And then you get to marriage, and there's sex. And suddenly kissing is great, but kissing's kissing. Come on, right? <laughs> okay, well, that's how it goes. That's how a relationship goes, and you don't back up. So, so purity is something, and guys, you ought to think of her and say, I want to guard the purity of my bride. I want her to be pure, and I don't want her to be impure at my hands. I don't want to be able to you know, not be able to have certain conversations with her because when we get married, I'm embarrassed about something. I, I'm telling you, and I've told my kids this, I have yet to meet the couple that says, I wish we'd have gone farther in our physical relationship while we were still dating. I have met all kinds of people that say, I blew it. And I wish I wouldn't have done that. Now look, I don't say that to, if you, if you blew it in your relationship in the past, God is gracious, he can forgive you, you can move on from that, you don't need to live under that guilt, okay? And yet, I just say this, you don't want to have to live with that. You don't want to have to live with that feeling um, that, that there's a regret that you went too far in your relationship. So I think, I think purity is something you very, uh, as Christians, you ought to be thinking about. Does it change when you're engaged? Well, no, not really. It might be that you start having much more honest conversations at that point. I don't think you ought to be talking in candid terms about your physical relationship until you're engaged and even then until you're close to being married. Uh, but you've got to decide what the boundaries are. And I would really encourage you to say, here's our boundaries that we're going to agree on together that are going to help us stay pure. Okay? If you've blown it in your past... And maybe you dated somebody and went too far and, you know, you're, you're, you're cooling off from that relationship and you're looking to have another relationship in the future. Listen, I, I just say to you, Christ is forgiving. He is so forgiving and he will renew and reconcile you and, and you don't have to carry this and feel like I, I'm dirty and I'm damaged goods and all that. That's not true with Jesus. Jesus Christ can cleanse you. And I honestly believe in sort of this idea of secondary virginity that God can restore some things to you and say, hey, you know what, you, you, you can be pure. You, you, can, you, can, you can once again know the purity of that. Um, yeah, yeah, is there anything you want to add to that? Well, I would just say also, you know, just again, be careful then how long the dating relationship lasts with someone and especially your engagement. I mean, you know, once, once, you're engaged, it should not be like, I'm engaged for a year, I haven't set a date, I don't know when we're gonna get married, but you're engaged for like one, two, however many years. 
That is a big mistake because... One month is great. Yeah, yeah. one month is good. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were engaged for like, was it three maybe? Four months. Four yeah. months. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was good. It gave us just enough time to plan our wedding. Um, and, you know, I mean, I know these days people are, you know, you keep watching those yes for the dress shows. It's ridiculous. They plan for these, you know, wedding days. And I don't know if they're planning at all for their marriage, you know, and they have all these grand plans. You just need to be circumspect about that and make sure your engagement lasts no longer than you need it to. Yeah. And if you're engaged for a long time because you're not sure about that person, then you probably shouldn't be engaged That's to them. Right. Right. Um, um, and, you know, even for dating, like, you need to kind of have in mind how long is a good dating relationship. I mean, I would say about a year is pretty good. All the seasons, you get to see them spring, winter, summer, fall, and see if they get you a Valentine's present or something like that. And if they do, they're probably good. So, um, you know, see what gifts they give you for the different seasons. You know, that's a good judgment call. But um, I, would, I would just say, you know, if you don't know that that person's, you know, going, that you're going the right direction with that person after about a year, you're probably wasting each other's time. Well, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, you're playing with fire. Yes, The truth of, of the matter is, I mean, the statistics sake, yeah. on, on the longer people are dating and engaged, the, the, the more likely they're going to be physically engaged and sexually right. engaged are, are astronomical. And some of you know this from experience. You were engaged or you were dating for a long time and you know that it turned physical on you and you, you know, it was like you just keep growing closer and closer and closer and that's what happens. So I think, I think, Listen, God, God doesn't say, hey, get to know this woman over 20 years, you know, and then marry her. I think, I think God brings people in your life, and you want to know, are they a Christian? And ladies, you've heard me say it. Does he love Jesus, and does he have a job, okay? And if he's got those two things and really loves Jesus more than he loves you, and I believe this. He ought to love Jesus. And one of the ways you'll know that, that he loves Jesus more than he loves you, is he will fight for your purity. Yeah. And if he doesn't fight for your purity, he doesn't love Jesus more than you. Or himself. Yeah, and he really <laughs> loves himself. And he's out, listen, I don't, you guy, you come talk to me. If you, if you think you can convince me that going to bed with that girl is because you love her, you're a liar <laughs> and a loser. And you need to not do that, okay? And, tell, and, and, and quit telling her that. And ladies, if a guy is saying that kind of thing to you, slap him and walk away. Okay, that's not, that's, not, that's not cool. All right. All right. Does my future spouse need to know my entire sexual past before we get married? Well, I think the short answer to that is yes. Now, having said that, do they need to know the gory details? No. No, but I believe that you, listen, otherwise, here's what you do. You carry a secret into your marriage that can be damaged. And you know what, by the way, I would encourage you to pick up the book, um, because you're going to read the, uh, the story of Grace Driscoll and how she hid a, a sin against her. She was molested against, and, and, and she hid that from, from Mark Driscoll for, for, for several years. And he had no idea what was going on. And so this secret just sort of festered. Finally, when she brought it out in the open, this is what God says, right? God is light. And he brings and he sheds light upon stuff. And suddenly Mark was like, broken for his wife instead of angry at her, right? And now they could work through this. So again, I, I'm a big believer that you should, you should come into marriage knowing I should know everything about her, she should know everything about me, and it doesn't mean that we had to share gory details, but, but that, that, that should be something that, that we know about one another, so that there's not a secret that then sort of undermines and lays under the surface. You don't want to have secrets with your spouse. You want that to be something. Now, you say, but that would be so devastating for them to know. Well, that's why you're telling them before you get married. And you're, and you're letting them know. And, 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 you know, this, this, might they punch out and say, I'm done? They might. They might. Um, but, but again, better now than then. And, and if you have the kind of relationship that's sort of blossoming toward marriage and you genuinely want another, then I love one another. And if part of the picture of marriage is the gospel, and what is the gospel? It's that Christ loves us when we're unlovable. This is one of those great moments, I think, where you start to really portray what the gospel means in your marriage. I know you've sinned. I know it. And I love you dearly. What a powerful, powerful 
image of the gospel. You, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it gives you a great opportunity to, to um, engage in forgiveness um, because it's not easy to hear those things, you know, but I mean, I think if we look back in our own lives, whether we've actually, you know, had a sexual past, I think all of us can look back and go, you know, you know, I, you know, I know for myself, I probably had more pharisaical tendencies where, you know, I, I didn't have overt issues, but I know my heart was wicked, right? So where, where's the difference? If, if, if there's been a physical uh, issue that's been committed and, and before you're married or whether my heart's committed, um, you know, ish, uh, fornication or whatever, it's the same in God's eyes. So we have both to admit a lot of things uh, before, you, before you get married. And it's a great opportunity to, to exercise forgiveness because you're going to need to do that your whole life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, may as well start before um, in that kind of uh, romantic stage where you don't think that there's anything wrong start practicing forgiveness early and often and forbearance because you're going to need it like crazy those are the best tools in your arsenal to to help your marriage along for the long for the long ter- long term good all right uh one one more uh how can i know if someone is the one for marriage uh well let me just say i don't think there is such a thing okay there is not the one um I'm so grateful that God brought, God brought Michelle into my life, right? I mean, she is the one for me, right? I mean, but could I, could she have married somebody else? Yes. I mean, because think about that. If there really is the one and anybody in the domino of the past upset that one, right, and they married your one, then like there was, because there was disobedience or whatever, then how, how did that then the whole future fails. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, it all falls apart because if, if somebody along the line made a mistake, then sort of the whole space-time continuum just blows up, right? You're now like, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to go back and redo it and get the right one who's married to my one, you know, whatever. I, that, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But, but I, here's what I'd say. Again, the, the only thing the Bible says of you is do they worship Jesus, is he the number one thing in their life? That, that's, that, now, the Bible then says, beyond that, it's kind of up to you to decide that's what you must have for it to be the one, if you're a believer in Jesus, okay? That you don't go and get married and shacked up, whatever, with anybody else unless they are a believer. Um, but, but, I, but I think there's practical things that you, you do. I mean, are you attracted to them? Physically attracted, Right? Um, cause, cause if you're not, it's probably not going well. Um, you know, I mean, yuck, I can't imagine having sex with you. So, you know, why, why would you get married to them then? Right. Uh, so there ought to be, there ought to be physical attraction. There ought to be the ability to provide, you know, uh, ladies, especially, I would say that for you, he, he needs to, he needs to be a guy that has a future plan for himself he knows what he wants to do. And even if his mind changes in 10 years, fine. But he's going, I got a direction in my life and I'm going for something. Uh, I think those are, those are some ways that you can, you can know. But I don't think, I don't, don't, don't wait for the voice from heaven. Okay, don't, don't wait for, you know, I've got my list of 85 things that this person has to fulfill and I'm checking them off as I'm with you to make sure you're the one for me. Don't do that. She's, you know... I don't know, she, th- 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 that's so wrong-headed in, in how, that's, that's not saying I'm going to work on myself, that's I'm going to try to find the one who is for me. How about rather than finding the one, how about you be the one? <laughs> how about you be the one that would be the trophy, and I don't mean that in a, in a you know, you're a, a piece of meat. I'm saying for any of you, guys, gals, you look at yourself and say, you know, I tell my kids, prepare yourself, Right? Run after Jesus. Make yourself the guy, the gal that, that people look at and say, boy, she, you know, she's going to make a good wife. He's going to make a great husband someday. You be that guy. You be that gal. And, and you be the one for somebody else rather than saying, oh, i got to find the one for me. Okay? Because I don't think that's the way God works. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's always risky, right? I mean, you know, it, it is. I mean, there's no question about it. It is. 
marrying someone is the riskiest thing that you can do. Um, and you know what? You, you don't do it lightly. You don't take it lightly. That's why you do date. That's why you, you date with, with those physical limitations so you don't get all wrapped up and that becomes the thing that you focus on. I mean, I dated a lot of guys, probably shouldn't have dated as many as I did um, because I just kind of had some identity issues, just to be honest with you, about, about dating and needing that relationship to make me whole. Um, and then when I met Chris, it was like he kind of totally turned that on its ear for me. And I know that that was God's best in my life. And there were some guys that I dated. Honestly, I, I think I could have married them. I could have. But boy, I'm glad I didn't. I mean, I'm really glad I didn't. And that was God's mercy to me to save me a lot of, of heartache over the years. And luckily, I mean, not luckily, but through God's sovereignty, you know, either I listened better or my parents were instrumental in helping in that, or God just took care of me out of his goodness to me <laughs> and in my, and for the lack of my, for my stupidity. Um, but it's always going to be risky, right? It's always going to be risky. And dating 20 years isn't going to make it better necessarily. You know, being engaged for three or four years isn't going to make it better. Right. you got to be willing to take the risk. And you know what? If you're not, then don't get married. Mm -hmm. Be committed to singleness. Okay, that brings up other things. But be committed to that. But if you're going to be married, just know that there's that risk involved. But God is there to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, one honestly great example I have of that is my own parents. They should have never gotten married. They married under complete rebellious circumstances. She wasn't supposed to even be married. She was in nursing school, and at the time, you weren't allowed to be married. And they were both not believers, really. They were serving each other. They got married out of rebellion. And I mean, you know, seven years or so into it, when, well, when I was seven, my dad was going to take off and leave my mom. And um, God reached down and saved my parents and saved their marriage and saved our home. And my parents, if you know them, they're so precious, but they are so opposite. <laughs> my dad is like, if you're 15 minutes um, you know, early, you're late. My mom is like, hey, I get out of the house at two. I mean, you know, that's a good day for her. Um, you know, it, they were so polar opposite and everything, but their one commitment, just like Chris said, is Jesus Christ. So once they made that decision, that is the glue that has held my parents together um, for almost 50 years. They're having their 50th anniversary in September. That's God's grace. Now, on the front end, you know, you have more choices to make. Uh, there's a list that, that we put together for that premarital counseling. Um, go, come to that class if you want to get some really good questions answered to help you make that decision, if all of those details are important to you, and some of them should be. Um, but God really is the glue. He's the one that does help you when you make that risky choice, and he helps you for the, for the long term. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you didn't marry those other guys either, because this would be weird yeah. right now. <laughs> it'd be awful. Well, not this would be awful, yeah. but that would have been awful. <laughs> Well, great Sorry. questions, guys. And, um, and baby, thank you for doing this with me. And, and uh, you are wise. And I appreciate the, the advice you gave to everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Let's give her a hand.